Hi, everyone. We're going to get started with today's webinar, uh, Top Legal Issues for Healthcare Investors and Business Development Teams. Uh, I'm Ryan Johnson, a Corporate Healthcare Attorney at Fredrickson & Byron. I'm here with my colleague, Marguerite. Hello, everyone. And today we're going to talk about um, legal issues in terms of uh, related to healthcare investment with a focus on venture capital type deals. Uh, before we get into that, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, uh, if you have questions during the presentation, uh, please hover over the bottom of the screen to see the chat feature. Um, if the internet audio does cut out, uh, please use the dial the number provided in the email. And with that email, you should also receive the slides for today's presentation. Um, next month, uh, David Glazer, who you're all well familiar with, will be talking about uh, issues relating to incident to shared visits and non-physician healthcare professionals. Uh, with that uh, overview, let's get into today's webinar. Uh, as many of you on the webinar uh, know, uh, there's a lot of investment activity in healthcare, uh, with a lot of that in the digital healthcare space. Uh, significantly, um, increasingly, uh, health systems are getting into the investment game, creating their own venture funds and investing in healthcare startups. Uh, after we talk a bit about some of those trends, I'm going to cover some of the bigger issues in investment term sheets uh, in healthcare venture, venture capital deals. And we'll then turn to Margie, uh, who will uh, cover due diligence um, for healthcare investments. So first, some healthcare investment trends. Uh, in 2017, there was 5.8 billion invested in digital healthcare companies in the United States. In the first quarter of 2018, uh, digital healthcare companies have already received $1.62 billion, with healthcare providers continuing to be one of the most prominent strategic investors, uh, representing 24% of corporate investor transactions in 2018. Uh, digital healthcare companies focusing on provider solutions, like administrative and clinical workflow, appear to be getting the most capital. And again, increasingly, health systems and hospital-based investors are making significant investments in digital healthcare companies. Now, there's a growing list of institutions uh, that have made investing in early, health, early stage healthcare startups part of their innovation strategy, including recently uh, Texas Medical Center, which launched a $25 million fund in 2017, uh, thereby joining the ranks of others like Mayo Ventures, Ascension Ventures, a subsidiary of the country's largest nonprofit Catholic health system, and Summation Health Ventures, a partnership of Cedar sinai and Memorial Care. Now, unlike many venture capitalist investors, health system investors are not generally interested in a quick exit, although they do expect a return on their investment. One obvious key difference between health system investors and traditional venture funds is that provider-sponsored funds are looking for emerging technologies that can be deployed across the provider system and managed by the health system's management team. Investment in startups places health systems and hospitals first in line for some of these opportunities, and many systems and hospitals are jumping into the venture capital startup investing, investment game. According to Accenture strategy, there are at least 60 hospital-sponsored venture capital funds actively investing in healthcare startups. And during the six year period from 2009 through 2015, they invested a total of $10 billion in healthcare technology companies. So what's driving this relatively new hospital or health system investment activity? Health system and payer investment activity fueled by the Affordable Care Act and its focus on value-based reimbursement is a large part of the answer. With a shift from fee-for-service to value-based payments, providers are taking on more risk for the cost and quality of care. Either they now have new incentives to find and implement software and data analytic tools to help them improve clinical efficiency, patient management, and provider productivity. Many observers expect hospital and health system venture activity to increase significantly in coming years. Uh, indeed, many expect systems to lead healthcare startup investments in the years ahead with their investments expected to reach 7.5 billion annually by 2020. In comparison, traditional corporate venture capital was only $3 billion in 2015. 
So now we're going to review some of the bigger issues that health system or hospital venture capitalists and startups typically negotiate in connection with VC type investments. We'll talk a bit about other financing options a bit later, including convertible notes, but the focus of this webinar will be on a VC Series A type investment. Now, one question we frequently get is whether a startup should have investors sign a confidentiality agreement or NDA before making a pitch or sharing information with an investor. Now, as you all know, well-drafted NDAs protect a company's intellectual property and confidential information. And we as lawyers generally advise our clients to have them signed whenever possible. However, startups often don't bother asking venture capitalists or other investors to sign NDAs. And often investors uh, refuse to sign them for a variety of legal and non-legal reasons. First, NDAs impose significant burdens on investors that are often looking at hundreds of companies or more and may have already invested in several companies some or many of which may be in the same or similar business as the startup or have similar technology to the startup. Tracking all these obligations under the various NDAs would be extremely difficult and the various contractual obligations can create unnecessary risks and liabilities for the investor. Also, many VC groups, including health system investors, have multiple people talking to multiple companies. Again, talking, tracking all these relationships and obligations is expensive, and creates more risk than most investors want to take on. So given that many investors will refuse to sign NDAs, how should companies protect their IP and confidential information? Now companies can take practical steps to protect IP during pitches and initial discussions by limiting disclosure of technical confidential information. Now there are circumstances of course in which companies should require investors to sign NDAs for example, before disclosing highly confidential technical information. But generally speaking, startup companies should expect most investors to decline to sign an NDA before a pitch. All right, let's move on to term sheets. Like I'll be focusing most of my comments today on a typical venture capital-like investment. But please keep in mind there are various ways for startups to raise money, various ways for uh, health systems and hospitals to invest in startup companies, and including uh, convertible debt and other, and other options. And although there are big differences among these various financing options, most sophisticated investors will try to structure most of their investments so that they get their money back first before the company's founders receive a return on their investment. All right, so when it, once an investor is interested in a company, They'll often put together a term sheet, which outlines the terms by which an investor will make a financial investment in the company. The term sheet typically covers three main sections, funding, corporate governance, and liquidation. Now, over the next several slides, I'll be covering some of the big issues that are negotiated in term sheets. Before I hand things off to Marguerite, who will be discussing some of the more important due diligence issues that investors should look at before uh, investing in the company. So a quick summary of the big issues we'll be covering, uh, valuation and dilution, liquidation preferences, corporate governance and the board of directors, various protective provisions that investors will often look for, the vesting of founder equity, anti-dilution protection for investors, and exclusivity. So first, uh, term sheets, valuation and dilution. Valuation in the context of a venture capital transaction is generally expressed in terms of pre-money valuation or post-money valuation. Pre-money valuation refers to the valuation of the company prior to the investment, whereas post-money valuation, as the name implies, refers to the value of the investment, of the value following the investment. Now let's look at an example with a startup and investor agreeing uh, that A, the company in which the investor will invest is worth $1 million, and B, the investor will put in 250000 The number of shares the investor will receive depends on whether this $1 million, uh, it, it, $1 million valuation is pre-money or post-money. If the $1 million valuation is pre-money, the company is valued at $1 million before the investment, and after the investment, it'll be valued at $1.25 million. 
if the $1 million valuation takes into consideration the $250,000 investment, it's referred to as post money, uh, meaning that it was worth $750,000 before the investment. Now, the valuation method used can affect ownership percentages in a very significant way. In our example, the investor would own 20% of the company with a $1 million pre-money valuation and 25% of the company with a post-money valuation of $1 million. Now, some startups really want the highest valuation possible. They should always think about valuation based upon the investor, keeping in mind that a lower valuation from a great investor may be, in many cases, better than a higher valuation from a bad investor. One final point, investors in startups will want to pay attention uh, to whether the stock option pools for future employees will be included in the pre-money price of the company, the value before the investor puts the capital in, or will be part of the post-money. Pre-money is more dilutive to the founders, meaning the founders will, founders will bear 100% of the dil dilution of the option pool, where post-money re reflects a sharing of the dilutive cost of the option pool with the new investors. All right, so term sheets liquidation preferences. The liquidation preference determines how proceeds will be shared following a liquidity event, meaning a sale of the company, a bankruptcy, et cetera. Now, venture capitalists almost always invest through a preferred equity instrument, typically referred to as preferred stock. Preferred stock is more valuable than common stock because preferred stockholders receive preferential treatment in the event of a liquidation of the business, like I mean a bankruptcy, dissolution, or sale. A liquidation preference protects an investment in those situations where the proceeds of a liquidation that would be distributed to all investors would be is less than the amount of the investor's original investment. This is done by first distributing proceeds to the whole of the preferred stock and next to all other shareholders. Now let's discuss three types of preferences. First, straight or non-participating preferred. This is the most favorable to the company. Upon the sale of the company or any other liquidation event, the preferred shareholders are entitled to the return of their entire investment. They get their money back, plus accrued dividends, prior to the distribution of any proceeds to the common shareholders. The second type of preference is participating preferred. Now, this is the most favorable to the investor. Like the straight pref uh, preference uh, I just described, the preferred stockholders are entitled to, to the return of their entire investment plus any accrued dividends prior to the distribution of any proceeds to the common shareholders, typically including the founders. However, with participating preferred, the preferred stockholders uh, also get treated like common stockholders and share rateably in remaining proceeds. And they get their money back, their investment back, and they also share pro rata and their di distribution of the remaining proceeds from the liquidation event. The third type of preference is capped or partially participating preferred. This is more of an intermediate approach. With this, the preferred shareholders have the same rights as participating preferred, again, return of investment, plus they get to share rateably pro rata in the remainder that's distributed to all shareholders, but their aggregate return is capped, just thereby protecting the common shareholders. Once, they receive, once the preferred shareholders receive the capped amount, they no longer have the right to share pro rata and remaining proceeds with the common stockholders. A uh, word of advice, remember the danger of creating precedent. So if you're issuing equity uh, in an earlier round and granting a preference, future investors will look for the same or a better preference uh, typically uh, in future rounds. All right, let's talk about governance and the board of directors. Uh, so the composition of the board of directors following an investment uh, by a health system venture capitalist or other investor is an extremely important issue. The board controls the hiring and firing of the CEO and key corporate decisions, including the financing and sale of the company, and for obvious reasons, founders and common stockholders and other investors often want some role in governance and often a position on the board. Often following an, an initial equity financing on the board, you'll have someone representing the investors, one or more of the founders, and occasionally independent directors. 
Now, generally speaking, boards often work best when investors, uh, preferred stockholders, and common representation, common shareholders, their representation on the board reflects the relative control or percent ownership of the company. Ultimately, it's important to have a functional board and make sure everyone's aligned uh, in terms of governance post-investment, but governance is often a very negotiated uh, in setting up um, you know, the, the post-investment uh, uh, governance and board of directors uh, set up. All right, protective uh, provisions. So many investors uh, want to make sure they have certain veto rights. If they don't control the board, don't control the, <clears throat> the company with respect to everything, you want to make sure they're in a position to veto certain fundamental type transactions, like the sale of the company, the amendment of the certificate of incorporation, finances, financings, and other very important matters. Uh, for investors and investees, control is critically important and it's hotly negotiated in almost every venture capital deal. Uh, the, the trick is obviously making sure that um, you strike the right balance with the investors, the founders, and the preferred stockholders. All right, founder vesting. So founder vesting um, is often considered a must in any uh, venture capital or uh, type deal. Uh, it's required to avoid free riding uh, by the founders, which can occur when a founder receives shares that are not subject to vesting and leaves the company. In such a case, he or she would continue to have the benefit of ownership post-investment while others do all the work. Well, obviously, investors uh, want to avoid the situation. Founder vesting is usually structured in the form of a lapsing repurchase right that allows the company to repurchase the founder's shares, often at the lower of the original issue price or fair market value if the founder leaves um, before the vesting has occurred. The repurchase right usually lapses in three or four years, but sometimes is based upon performance milestones. Now, you might assume that founders would be reluctant to agree to a vesting schedule, putting their shares at risk. But I mean, the fact of the matter is most in VCs and sophisticated, and sophisticated investors require the founders to agree to a vesting schedule to make sure the founders have skin in the game. Also, if there are multiple founders, they'll typically agree um, amongst themselves uh, to a vesting schedule to make sure that they're all committed as a team uh, to stick together until a certain milestone or exit event. Now, founders often ask in negotiations what happens to their unvested stock if the company is sold or if they're fired. Now, there are different ways to address this issue. Uh, first, something on a single trigger vesting accelerates vesting of any unvested shares as of the time of sale or a change of control occurs, meaning that the founder can walk away from the company with fully vested shares upon such an event. Double trigger investing accelerate, uh, means that unvested shares will vest if both A, the company is sold or is a change of control, and the employer founder is terminated without cause within some period of time following the closing of the sale. Now, founders are often concerned about what happens if their employment is terminated without cause, which is understandable. However, investors should be reluctant to allow acceleration upon without cause termination, since cause is often defined to include very bad behavior, theft, conviction of crimes, etc. It's expensive to prove in a court of law. And cause typically does not include general ineffectiveness. And many companies and investors will want to have the ability to remove ineffective management in a uh, relatively efficient and not too costly manner. Anti-dilution. Investors are often concerned about the value of their investment if there are future down rounds. You know, the company sells its shares at a price per share lower than an earlier offering. Anti-dilution protection provides for preferred stock to be entitled to a larger percentage of the company's pre-financing equity upon the occurrence of a down round. Now, there are two main approaches to dealing with this, uh, one being broad-based broad weighted average, uh, in which the adjustment depends upon the number of shares sold relative to the ex company's existing stock, as well as the difference in price. The second but far less common anti-dilution provision is what's a full, known as the full ratchet, uh, 
which means adjust the number of common shares the preferred shares can be converted into based upon the new share price. Either approach prevents the problems of issuing additional shares without consideration and increasing the liquidation preference of the preferred stocks, the number that is greater than the amount originally negotiated, which again is typically the amount of the investment. So term sheets are often non-binding generally, except uh, for uh, the exclusivity period, which means that for some period of time, the startup company will not talk to other investors. Now this is a reasonable provision to include from the perspective of the startup company and the investor. Uh, investors are typically incurring legal and other expenses as they evaluate possible investment in a company, they're doing due diligence, they're drafting term sheets, et cetera. The, the trick here is making sure the term sheet, the, the exclusivity period is not too long. Uh, 30 to 45 days is reasonable and pretty customary. So pros and cons with term sheets. Um, you know, High-level pros are usually non-binding, meaning that you can demonstrate commitment without being locked into a deal. Term sheets can help identify points of dispute early in the process. Uh, and you can either work through those early on or not and walk away from the deal. Although they're non-binding, term sheets can create a moral commitment. Once someone puts something in writing and says, here's how the deal's gonna take place, it's often harder, it's harder for someone to walk away. Uh, term sheets also can help people avoid misunderstandings and how the deal is going to take place. Cons, um, it can be expensive to, to engage professionals to prepare and negotiate term sheets, especially if jumping down to the third point there, you get bogged down in details. Um, another con is sometimes term sheets are drafted in a way that is uh, negligent or sloppy and creates binding obligations that no one intended to include in the non-binding term sheet, including the duty to negotiate in good faith, for example. All right. So now that we've covered some of the big issues in VC type term sheets, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about other financing options used by uh, health system or hospital investors. Uh, the first is convertible debt. Uh, convertible debt is a loan with principal interest, but by its terms can be converted into the issuing startup company's equity upon certain triggering events, typically in connection with what's known as a qualified financing. Now, many initial funding rounds are structured as convertible debt, where there re really isn't an appetite or cash uh, with, at the company uh, to cover cost, expense of a traditional seed equity round or going to a full VC round. Uh, convertible debt also puts off valuation issues until a later date, which is attractive to many companies. And some convertible debt is often used in earlier funding rounds, and many health system investors will use this approach instead of the more VC-like uh, structure we just discussed. The term sheets for convertible note deals are typically not nearly as involved or heavily as negotiated uh, as equity-type discussions, um, just the dollar amounts and control issues are not nearly as, as significant in convertible debt deals. A couple of quick comments, uh, convertible notes, pros and cons. Uh, from the company's perspective, the startup company, it's often faster and cheaper than uh, going to equity. It, it continues to provide the startup company with greater control, uh, delays dilution issues when you bring in new owners. Um, there are risks of being um, unable to pay the debt uh, to the um, debt holder. Um, from the investor's perspective, again, it's faster and cheaper. Uh, one concern is you have debt in an insolvent entity. Startups often don't have a lot of cash. Uh, so having debt in an insolvent entity isn't often very uh, valuable. You have less control than you would in an equity type transaction. Um, again, there's a problem of as you negotiate these deals, uh, the discount rate uh, and, and risk. Now, we don't have time to go into sort of all the, the key issues in convertible notes today. I'll you know, kind of tee up that typically you negotiate conversion rate when you automatically convert from debt to equity, what's optional, what the interest rate might be, both the general interest rate if there's an event of default, what the maturity date is, whether there'll be any collateral, which is unusual um, for a convertible note type investment in a startup, and under what circumstances you can amend the note. 
Uh, final slide before uh, I hand it off to Marguerite to talk about due diligence. Uh, another option for health system or hospital investors is to consider um, a C type investment um, or a Series A light in which the investor will get equity in the startup company without all of the protections uh, of a typical full Series A investment. And most of the issues I discussed earlier were for a typical Series A investment. With a seed preferred or a Series A light, investors usually will get a liquidation preference and certain preemptive rights, um, which can be helpful. They, they won't get all the same protections and benefits we talked about in some of the earlier slides. And with that, I'll hand it off to Marguerite to talk about uh, due diligence. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> all right, uh, due diligence. So as with any investment or business opportunity, a potential investor should assess the risks and rewards by doing due diligence on the target company. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that the entity that you're uh, thinking about investing in is actually complying with the laws applicable to its business and independently review the business to make sure the company isn't overstating its potential for success. Before we get into um, the actual components of due diligence, let's talk a little bit about the scope uh, of the review that would be appropriate for some of the arrangements um, and investments Ryan was discussing earlier. An investor can tailor the due diligence based on various factors relating to the size and the nature of the proposed investment. Uh, to determine the appropriate scope, we recommend considering various factors, including the size of the investment, uh, but with that, you should um, view that in light of not only the absolute size of the investment, but also the investor's resources. So a small investment to a large hospital system uh, is going to uh, be a huge investment for a smaller company. Uh, the, you should also look to the investor's technical expertise, whether they have bandwidth to perform due diligence in-house. Uh, this stage of the funding, uh, if it's um, some, a, Series A or a Series A light, as Ryan's talking about, you would take a different approach to a later stage investment where there would actually be some um, core uh, business revenues and products to be assessing. Uh, you also want to look at the investor's understanding of the regulatory landscape. Um, if the investor has made other investments in the space and is uh, really familiar with the regulatory risks, uh, you would um, adjust the diligence process accordingly. Uh, you look to the investor's overall risk tolerance, uh, and then also whether the nature of the relationship creates particular regulatory risk. You want to remember that all companies have some kind of a blind spot, so don't overlook the importance of uh, doing your diligence on a target company. For instance, um, you might understand a business's core regulatory risks, particularly if your role within um, your company is regulatory or compliance related, but the target company may not have those dedicated regulatory and compliance folks on staff, and they may be missing something obvious. Another common pitfall we see is that investors will pres presume, um, particularly in cases where a startup has already cobbled together funding, um, that somebody else has done the diligence, that somebody else has looked and, and made sure that the uh, regulatory risks are, are appropriate. Um, so we would really recommend considering a, a doing a deep dive on the regulatory risks faced uh, by a particular target, particularly if your organization has the resources, if you have an in-house team um, that can look at those regulatory risks. And at the very least, you should confirm um, what outside third parties have, have done in the past. All right. There are some aspects of due diligence that are fairly standard across all industries. Uh, investors want to look at problems or risks, and to do that, you need to dig into the financial records of the business, look at litigation activity, material contracts. For instance, you might want to know about key customers or clients and whether the terms of those agreements are favorable to uh, the entity you're investing in. Uh, you want to look at employees and operations, as well as um, intellectual property, uh, which Ryan will cover a little bit later. You may not want to request as much information as you would if you were doing an outright acquisition, but you still want to have a really good understanding of the business and the associated risks. What I'm going to focus on uh, is some of the specific healthcare regulatory issues. 
The laws applicable to healthcare providers um, are certainly too numerous to outline in a webinar today, but I'm going to touch on a few of the top regulatory issues that we deal with in diligence, including the anti-kickback statute, Stark Law, corporate practice prohibitions, fee splitting prohibitions, and uh, privacy issues. Depending on the type of entity uh, an investor is looking at, not all of these may apply. Uh, and depending on the nature of the business or the startup, others might be applicable. So those could include FDA regulations, complex reimbursement issues, certificate of need requirements, or um, restrictions related to nonprofits. So this is in no ways um, intended to be uh, uh, exhaustive uh, list of the regulatory issues. All right, the anti-kickback statute. The federal anti-kickback statute makes it illegal to offer, solicit, make, or receive any payment that is intended to influence referrals under a federal health care program. So that includes Medicare and Medicaid, as well as a few other um, health care programs. It's a federal criminal statute, and the goal behind it is really to protect the Medicare program from overutilization that would result from bribes or kickbacks. When the government looks at uh, compliance under the anti-kickback statute, it applies what, what is called the one purpose test. A payment arrangement um, may have many legitimate purposes, but if any one purpose is to influence referrals, then the payment is going to be illegal. There are various different safe harbors that a party uh, might rely on to be truly safe under the anti-kickback statute. Um, and in, if an arrangement meets all of the elements of the safe harbor, uh, then you're free from scrutiny under the anti-kickback statute. But uh, those can be quite difficult to meet, and you're not required to meet a safe harbor under the statute. You would then just default again to that one purpose test to determine whether or not there was an intent to reward or influence referrals. One important thing to note is that many states have their own uh, what we call mini anti-kickback statutes. And many of these apply in a broader fashion um, and apply uh, regardless of the payer type, so extending into commercial um, payer business. So an investor will want to get comfortable with a startup or other target's compliance with the anti-kickback statute before making an investment. First and foremost, uh, you want to make sure that you understand the landscape of the applicable law. So are there referrals being made for federal health care program business, or is there a state law that would mean that you'd have to look at uh, relationships impacting private payer business? And then you want to do a review of any agreements, um, whether those are written or oral, that the company has with uh, referral sources. You want to review internal policies that they may have uh, regarding how they assess arrangements for compliance with the anti-kickback statute. Um, and uh, make sure that you feel very comfortable uh, with their compliance in this area. The federal Stark Law is, uh, in many ways, similar to the federal anti-kickback statute. But unlike the anti-kickback statute, where uh, intent is critical, Stark is a strict liability statute uh, that will impose civil pen penalties for any violation. Stark applies in a more limited set of circumstances than the anti-kickback statute. Uh, these would include any referral relationships for uh, DHS or designated health services. There are um, about 11 categories of services that um, fall into uh, the definition of designated health services. Some of the more common are uh, clinical lab services, imaging services, uh, DME, and both inpatient and outpatient hospital services. If there is a physician referring for DHS and the physician has a financial relationship with the provider, then you need to be able to meet one of the exceptions under Stark. Uh, a financial relationship will include um, both investment interests and compensation arrangements, uh, and those include both direct or indirect um, financial arrangements. So you want to look um, kind of up uh, the path of ownership in a company and across various different uh, relationships. The analysis uh, can get pretty complicated, um, and if you don't mean an exception, it's an automatic uh, violation. 
Similarly to the uh, concept of mini anti-kickback statutes, many states will have their own mini Stark statute. Um, and many of these will apply in a manner that will require a completely separate analysis from um, your traditional federal Stark analysis. Uh, for instance, they might have a, a different listing of services uh, for what qualifies as a, a DHS under the state law, or it may apply to other types of providers. Uh, so similarly, uh, an investor is going to want to get comfortable with the target's compliance with Stark before making an investment. You'll want to, again, look to the landscape of applicable law. Is there DHS involved in what the startup is, um, is providing? Uh, are there referrals for federal healthcare program business? Look to see if there is a, a mini Stark law that would be applicable. And then you're going to want to review any uh, agreements um, with referral sources and look at any physician compensation arrangements and scrutinize those closely to make sure that they comply uh, with Stark. The Corporate Practice of Medicine Doctrine uh, prohibits for-profit businesses from owning medical practices or employing physicians or in any other manner controlling um, professional uh, judgment. The doctrine is fairly antiquated at this point. It was first introduced at the beginning of the 20th century by the American Medical Association. And the goal was uh, making sure that the control of the medical profession and medical judgment was placed solely in the hands of doctors uh, and preventing uh, profit incentives from skewing decision-making in the industry. The majority of states uh, have a corporate medical corporate practice medicine prohibition, uh, but they vary greatly in terms of how robustly they're defined um, and enforced. In many states, the Medical Practice Acts um, do not explicitly prohibit the corporate practice of medicine, um, so you have to look to judicial interpretations or attorney general opinions um, that form the scope of the practice based on those public policy considerations. Uh, I will note that the corporate practice doctrine isn't just limited to medicine. In many states, it will apply to dental practice or the practice of therapy or physical therapy. And essentially what it boils down to for um, an, from an investment perspective is that you need to make sure that the entity uh, that you're thinking about investing in is not inappropriately practicing a profession or employing individuals that is not permitted to employ under state law. There are a number of reasons why you should care about the corporate practice uh, doctrine. Violations of the corporate practice doctrine can result in a number of um, actions that would be really detrimental to the uh, to the startup. So those include uh, injunction against continued practice, uh, criminal prosecution. Um, it can invite the close scrutiny of payers, which could uh, choose to refuse um, to pay claims. Um, so you really want to make sure that you are operating in compliance with the corporate practice um, of of medicine or any other uh, profession uh, with regards to the startup. So in states with a corporate practice prohibition, uh, there are still permissible ways to structure business arrangements that involve the provision of professional services. The management structure uh, on the slide right now is one common way. I'm not going to uh, go through this in too much detail, but essentially the idea is that you break out professional and non-professional activities and assets, and you divide those across the professional corporation, which would be owned by those licensed professionals, uh, and then a management management company um, who would run the non-clinical aspects of the business. Again, uh, these are going to need to be structured to comply with all of the nuances of each state's corporate practice uh, restrictions, uh, and also comply with um, with other laws, including uh, fee splitting. So. Uh, fee splitting statutes are found in most states and prohibit the sharing of fees received for healthcare services or items. Um, often, in, often these will appear in professional licensing statutes or 
regulations, uh, but they can also appear in just general healthcare laws uh, that will make them applicable to a broader set of healthcare professionals. The policy rationale behind these laws are that, again, we don't want to skew professional judgment with profit motives. Um, and whether these laws apply directly or indirectly uh, is largely going to depend on the type of um, target entity that you're, you're looking at. But you'll want to review arrangements with um, providers and the startup to make sure those arrangements comply with the applicable state law. All right, uh, so one of the biggest areas of diligence that I focus on in my practice is HIPAA compliance. Uh, this is likely going to be a slightly simpler analysis to at least determine whether HIPAA applies. If the uh, startup is either a covered entity, so a provider or a, um, a acting as a business associate to other covered entities, you're going to want to look uh, into its HIPAA compliance. First, you want to check to make sure uh, that the company has the core HIPAA documentation in place. So at a minimum, you're going to want to look at whether they have privacy and security rule policies and procedures, breach notification policies and procedures, uh, whether they're performing their security rule risk assessments, um, whether they have business associate agreements in place with their uh, vendors and contractors, or if they are a business associate, you're going to want to look to see if uh, they have subcontractor BAAs in place with uh, their third-party vendors and contractors. Uh, if it's a provider, um, you're going to want to make sure that they have a notice of privacy practices as well. Beyond just documentation, uh, an investor should be confident that uh, the uh, company is actually um, complying with the policies. So one way to look at that is to see if these are just off-the-shelf policies that they have uh, plugged in place or if they've actually been customized, implemented, and are following those policies. Uh, you can look to see if they've sufficiently trained their employees and have documentation of that training, um, see if they're assessing and tracking their security incidents, um, whether they're auditing and monitoring their compliance and, again, documenting that. So there are all sorts of ways that you can uh, look to see if they're um, not just on paper HIPAA compliant. Uh, an investor should also be thinking about the way the entity addresses potential HIPAA security uh, risk areas. An entity should be able to identify and articulate various security and privacy compliance risks and how it intends to take action to protect the entity against those risks. Um, finally, so every entity is going to have some sort of health privacy risks. Uh, so a potential investor is going to need to weigh the nature of those risks, um, look at any identified gaps, and the potential to actually mitigate those risks. Diligence uh, shouldn't be restricted to just HIPAA. Depending on where the startup or other entity is operating, um, you could be subject to various different state health record laws. Uh, state data security and breach notification laws. There are particular federal laws that apply uh, depending on the type of in industry you're involved in. For instance, uh, substance use disorder records are subject to 42 uh, CFR Part 2, which is a whole set of um, confidentiality regulations separate and apart from HIPAA. Uh, and then there may be international rules or regulations like the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. A potential investor is going to want to dive into how the entity is handling security risks, um, particularly in light of the fact that many of the startups that uh, Ryan was discussing focus on digital or mobile health platforms. And an investor should feel really confident that the target is taking security risks seriously, that they're performing risk assessments, uh, implementing reasonable policies and procedures based on um, the latest standards, uh, looking at cybersecurity, uh, making sure it has appropriate data use agreements in place and is adequately controlling for third-party risk. Another area to consider is key employees. In reviewing the business, uh, the investor should determine uh, which employees are critical to the success of the business. 
those employees should then be sufficiently tied to the business. That could be through non-competes or other restrictive covenants, um, other robust employment terms, um, maybe a good incentive structure that will tie them to the business. Uh, these employees could be in leadership roles, sales roles, or uh, key developers of the product itself. Uh, but the last thing an investor wants is to uh, invest in a business because they believe in a particular person and then have that employee leave the business immediately after their investment is made. All right, now I will turn it back over to Ryan to discuss intellectual property. All right, thank you. Just a couple of quick comments. <clears throat> Uh, intellectual property is obviously very important to many startup companies, and investors should work with their legal counsel in the due diligence process uh, to confirm the company has clear title to all critical IP. Uh, as part of that process, it often makes sense to talk to the key developers uh, to make sure that the investors and their legal counsel understand, again, who developed the IP. Are they all employees, or are they consultants or independent contractors? Uh, regarding consultants and others who help develop the IP, uh, the investors will want to make sure that there are proper assignments on file, uh, meaning that uh, everyone who worked on the key intellectual property assigned all of their rights to those inventions to that IP to the company. If that hasn't been done, um, it can still be done in connection with the investment, but ultimately, investors will want to make sure the company has all the IP it needs. Uh, to succeed. A uh, couple of comments about open source software. Uh, using open source software is often a good way for startups uh, to speed development. It's often cheap, um, but it sometimes comes with obligations under the applicable license agreement for the open source software. Uh, sometimes the open source licenses require the free distribution of the software um, of the company. Um, this can have significant business model problems for investors and acquirers. So if there was open source software, make sure that the open source software light agreements are reviewed by counsel to make sure you understand, again, what the company owns, doesn't own, and what, what might have to be shared more generally with the public. So that, in a nutshell, are some of the kind of the high level due diligence issues uh, that investors will often look at in connection with a healthcare investment. Um, we can obviously go much deeper, cover other laws and regulations in the space, cover other business issues. Um, you know, again, in some uh, healthcare systems, hospitals, large position groups are getting much more involved in investing in startups, and there are different options for doing that, convertible debt, seed rounds, a more venture capital type approach. And we'd be happy to answer any questions you have on the investor side if you're looking to make such an investment or if you're a startup uh, trying to bring in investors. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to sit through this with us for today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Marguerite or me. I think our contact information is on the next slide. You can reach us via email or via phone, uh, but thank you so much and look forward to uh, all of you at, during next month's webinar.